now our first guest of the day. He is the publisher of Extra Points, an outstanding writer for college sports and friend of the program, Matt Brown. Matt, welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me again. Might I add, the pennant wall behind you is looking better than ever. That is quite the collection you have there, my friend. No, I, I appreciate it. It's nice. I haven't gotten the Room Raider treatment yet, but it, it is a, you know, a little bit nice to have something a little bit different in, in the backdrop here. And whenever I interview an AD or a university president on camera, they often look at that and go, well, my school's not on there, so I don't even have to buy these anymore, which is, which is great. You know, I'll have to change around a little bit. Well, and you, you told us uh, before, before the interview started, because you have a you have a, a, a big uh, like the normal size pennant of BYU, but you said you've been looking for a, a, a mini version of that, and you cannot find one. So obviously, we've got a lot of people. BYU Sports Nation has quite the reach. We may be able to have somebody out there that may have one, may be willing to to let you have it. You know, you know, I have a lot of these really small pennants that came from this collection in the late 50s. If somebody has a friend, has a friend whose elders quorum president is like a collector <laughs> of memorabilia or something, you know, my email is matt at extrapointsmb.com. I have an Etsy alert set up, but I, I was joking. If I spend $200 on one of these pennants, I'm either going to get in trouble with the tax man or my wife <laughs> or probably both. So we should probably try to limit it to under that. Yeah. All right, fans across BYU Sports Nation, we're putting you on blast. Go to work, do your research, do your <laughs> homework, see if you can help Matt Brown out. And maybe the BYU store, athletic marketing, just maybe. They've it is the official outfitter of Somebody. BYU fans everywhere. This is very true. Okay, I'm Matt. I'm hearing this. Now that we've got the pennant situation at least taken care of for now, um, how's your life right now? Uh, thanks to college football realignment. And uh, I know that you are not only you know a guy that follows BYU, but you follow Ohio State closely. Ohio State's going to have a couple of new friends in the Big Ten Conference in USC and UCLA in a couple of years. How's life been as you kind of ponder realignment with the Trojans and Bruins coming to Big Ten country? No, I, 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 listen, when we this whole thing started, I don't think I had this gray hair right here, right? Like, <laughs> I have been wanting to take a longer vacation almost as long as I, since I started Extra Points. And the last time I took a real vacation, I actually went out to Utah. I went to go see some family, go take my kids hiking because we don't have mountains in Chicago. And that's when the Austin case broke. So I'm sitting here like trying to edit some kind of like legal opinion from Kodachrome State Park. I was supposed to be out of, you know, in the woods now. Obviously, that's not going to happen. It's hard to really overstate, I think, how dramatic the USC-UCLA change is, not just for what the Big Ten looks like, but for the future of super conferences and, and league consolidation and what the balance of power looks like for college sports in general. It's gigantic. See, and I think that's what's interesting right now because once that news happened, and obviously it just blew everything up, since then, at least publicly, things have quieted down. How quiet are things behind the scenes right now, Matt? They are never as quiet as they appear in public. So I mean, I've, and I've said this a lot, and this is coming from a guy that's broken a couple of these stories. Like the number of people at a school or at a conference office that really know what's going on with realignment or these kind of changes, it's a small circle. It's your president, maybe an AD, maybe one, one or two associates, and then some people in the media, broadcasting, consulting world. And that's really about it. It's definitely not coaches or assistants or, or other people in that space. So if those, you know, th those, that eight, nine, 10 people, they don't want to talk it's really difficult to get things out in public. What's happening right now is you have a lot of administrators who are doing a lot of data analysis and data digestion. You don't wanna make a rash decision without really having a better idea of what, what do our media partners value our conference for 2023 or 2024? What will our revenue look like in the next couple of years? And what are some scenarios to do that? You don't wanna jump conferences without realizing that maybe Fox or ESPN was gonna make a bigger, uh, a bigger offer later on. So I would be very surprised if there's a gigantic move in the next couple of weeks. I mean, I had been hearing last week from some ADs that they hadn't even heard back from ESPN about what an ES, a Pac-12 ACC partnership would look like. So you can't join the Big 12 if you don't know the other, the, the other side's best offer right now. Matt Brown is the publisher of Extra Points. We are talking college football realignment. In your opinion, Matt, what is the next domino to fall, wherever that may be? I, if I had to put money on it, I honestly think the next domino is probably still going to be at the FCS or one AAA level because we still have a couple of smaller D1 leagues that are, are, are aggressively trying to backfill. At the Power 5 level, the conventional wisdom seems to be that it centers on Notre Dame. And one of the maybe frustrating things about this for a fan is Notre Dame's decision about what they want to do isn't primarily or even or certainly not exclusively 
driven by how much money that they can make. Notre Dame's going to make more money in the Big Ten now. That's true three weeks from now. That was true three months from now. The, the key factor for them is championship access. If they feel like they have a pathway to a college football playoff as an independent, they'll stay that way. And that means the Big Ten probably stays at 16. Did the, the, did the events of the last two weeks change that calculus? Maybe, maybe not. Do we know what the college football playoff is going to look like in two or three years? Maybe, maybe not. That, that's so, and, and until there's clarity on that front, I don't think you're going to see anything gigantic happen at the Power Five level. As you just mentioned, the two most important things that's spurring all of this is playoff access and what that looks like, and then obviously finances. Those are the two things that are driving every bit of what we're seeing. With that in mind, though, we were talking about this in our last segment, rivalries. Should rivalries matter in realignment? I mean, as a, as a consumer, the obvious answer to that would be uh, absolutely. And it, I think it's been a, a really unfortunate over the last several years that many important rivalries, whether that's Kansas, Missouri, Texas, Texas A&M, BYU, Utah, uh, you know, anything that Maryland had with any of their fans, uh, you know, was, was, was torn up after realignment. What, what I have been hearing and, and from kind of being on this beat here for a little while is if you don't have a $11 billion to kind of paper over some of these problems, like the Big Ten might right now, rivalries are really important, not just for fan engagement. They're honestly important financially. Having history, having geographic proximity, having uh, honest to goodness, like profound dislike from one another, that's not just great for ESPN. That's great for your MMR partners. That's great for anybody you're trying to work with for sponsorships. That's great for ticket sales. And so I know at the mid-major level, it's extremely important. Whatever the Big 12 decides to do, whether that's now, whether that's in 2024, whether that's six years from now, they're not going to have Big 10 or SEC money to paper over imperfections. You want to be able to have as much inventory for sponsorships, for media partners, and for fan engagement as possible. And that's going to come with deep rivalries, which is something that this league right now, with four new members from all over the country, doesn't have at, at, at scale the same way that the SEC or the Big Ten have. In many ways, it feels like a race to become the third most powerful conference because, let's face it, right now, no other conference is going to catch the Big Ten and the SEC. So it's a race for third place. Matt, is the Big 12 right now the third most secure and powerful conference? And if not, what do they need to do to get to that position? I honestly don't think right now there's a significant appreciable difference between the ACC, Pac-12, and Big 12 in terms of power, when it, whether that's broadcast money or influence within various NCAA subcommittees or what the transformation committee is going to look like. The big two are really very significantly far uh, in front of everybody else. Now, as a fan, I think it's fair to say, well, what does that matter? Because even, yeah, the Big Ten has a ton of money and they haven't won anything in college basketball in like 20 years. <laughs> the Big 12 doesn't have that same, those, that same uh, amount of resources and arguably have the best men's basketball conference in the country and one that could be getting better. The ACC doesn't have the same amount of money. Clemson's still been able to make the college football playoff. They've still been able to win games at an elite level. So I think it's fair to wonder... At what point does that money and influence matter? If one of these other leagues goes away, you know, by, by nature of it, whoever ends up absorbing more of those members will have some more power and influence. But I, I don't know if there's a difference in the way that matters to most people listening to this program between being number three and number five, especially because that's going to change a lot depending on the year in the sport. The report uh, within the last 24, 30 hours or so that the SEC is, is telling everybody that they're fine at 16, and they're hoping that if they, they stay at 16, that will help kind of sort of curb the, the expansion talk. Number one, do you buy it? And, and number two, does, does I, I guess the way I look at it is maybe the only thing that really changes is, is we'd originally heard maybe 2022 is what they were, were looking to get to. Instead of everybody trying to race to 20 or 22, it seems like everybody would just race to try and get to 16 to, to be with the SEC. What do you make of that report and what it could mean? What, what I make of this, uh, you know, one, I mean, for all of these kind of reports, you have to ask yourself, is, is this outlet somebody that is likely to have direct conversation with one of the people that has firsthand knowledge of these things? You know, so maybe that's true. Maybe that's not. Sometimes on the Internet, that's not true. But I think for everybody, you're good at 16. You're good at 14. You're good at 12 until you're not. 
Um, you know, from what I had heard over the summer, and I talked to administrators in the Big Ten, is they weren't really actively looking for expansion candidates. They didn't feel like that was you know critical for their strategic plan. They were very uh, deep in their conversations for their next TV rights deal before UCLA and USC entered the picture at all. And then suddenly that opportunity became available to them. That changed the plan. If I was an SEC AD or president, I don't think I would look at anything the Big Ten just did as an existential threat. You're very powerful. You can be secure at 16. If, I don't know, in 18 months, there's reason to believe that maybe the ACC's grant of rights agreement isn't as legally enforceable as it seems right now. Mm -hmm. Or if maybe somebody you know approaches them with a briefcase of $200 million willing to buy themselves out of those deals, suddenly maybe 18 looks a little bit more attractive. I mean, it, 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 nobody wants to get out there in public and say like, no, we're not really satisfied with our conference membership and we want to make changes right now. But that doesn't mean that they're not taking the call if somebody else is reaching out behind the scenes. By the way, doesn't it feel like the only the only reason a briefcase is used these days is to fill it with money? Like nobody <laughs> nobody carries a briefcase anymore, right? You're just going to put money in it. It's it's either money or like very dramatic illegal documents. Like brief, <laughs> it's it's all like, are you going to be in a born movie? Is this where we hide our like fake passports and like the fake gun or something? That's a briefcase. I haven't seen anybody else use one in a decade. Yeah, if, if someone sees a briefcase, automatically think there's like, something really like, important in like there. There's cash in there. There is there is yeah. there is a lot of money in that briefcase. There's a mini BYU you gotta, pennant you, in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to flag that person in airline security. Like there, there's either college football history or foreign currency in that thing. That's very suspicious. Great stuff, just with Matt Brown, the publisher of Extra Points. We do need to ask you uh, before we let you go, Matt, about the Big 12 and the Pac-12 and the race of sorts that they are in right now. Yeah. Is it in the best interest of the Big 12 if the Pac-12 does have a demise and it goes away? I can't wrap my head around a world of college sports with no Pac-12, but here we are. Is it in the best interest of the Big 12 to pull members from the Pac-12? I mean, if, if, if that option is earnestly available, sure. I, mean, I, I think it would absolutely make the Pac-12 a more – uh, financially viable and, and uh, attractive conference if it had Utah in it with BYU. It, 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 would, it would be valuable to have access to the Phoenix television market and the fact that that area is growing so, mu so much with transplants. I don't think it's necessarily critically required. And it, I, it's also really important to keep in mind here, when you don't have Big Ten money, there are real logistical problems with having a conference that would span four time zones, depending on what Arizona ends up doing with like daylight savings. If you're flying from Morgantown, West Virginia or Cincinnati to Arizona, to Utah, to Colorado all the time, that's not just expensive. There's jet lag. There's a, that's a lot of missed class. That means a lot of games on weird TV windows for, for viewers, either in the East coast or the mountain time, like BYU fans are going to have to get used to uh, weird time zones when they're watching their teams play in West Virginia or Florida or Cincinnati. And there comes a point where that isn't always worth it. It's probably worth it for the big 12, but the, I think the real human costs of that would be felt even more strongly than they would be with the big 10 where those costs really are very significant. Matt, great to catch up with you. And uh, for one, we've got a briefcase to track down and a pennant to track down to put inside the briefcase. We'll get on that. Uh, in the meantime, how can BYU fans and college football fans in general find more of your work? You bet. I write Extra Points, which is a newsletter that publishes every day that covers all the off-the-field stuff that shapes the college sports industry, whether that's reporting at the EA Sports College football game, mm. conference realignment, university athletic department finance, all of that stuff you can find at Extra Points MB, or you can follow me on Twitter at Matt Brown EP. Great stuff. Matt, good to talk to you, man. Take care. Thanks, Matt. It's always a pleasure. Take care, guys.